Did the James Webb Telescope discover life on an exoplanet? What is going on? Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Placebo Effect podcast. We're going to get into this, y'all. So recently, there was a scientist who's gone on record, a scientist out of Cambridge, Professor Niku Madhusudan out of Cambridge, has been doing research on data coming back from James Webb. And for those of you that are watching, we're going to do a little bit of a reaction video stuff as well. So he went on an interview to talk a little bit more about this. So let's check this out. Tell us where and when you found this. So last year, uh, we had uh, some JWST observations with the James Webb Space Telescope of this planet, uh, its atmosphere, and we detected for the first time ever carbon-bearing molecules like methane and CO2 uh, in its atmosphere and did not detect other molecules like ammonia, which said that it should, it's likely to have an ocean uh, underneath the atmosphere. But we also saw a tentative sign of this molecule dimethyl sulfide, which we weren't sure but still, even the Okay, so <laughs> dude's talking about finding water too. So let's let's back up this train a little bit and I'll give you a little bit more background. So Hubble actually has been part of this research for a minute as well. I think 2019, we wanna go far back. Let's take a look at this little summary from the Hubble cast. The Hubble is basically saying that they took a look at this exoplanet and they found data that showed there was water. <laughs> so what do they mean when they say data? What are we talking about, y'all? To quote my man, Alan Iverson, we talk about practice, y'all. We talk about practice. So the data, using the air quotes time, the data, right, is captured with infrared heterodyne spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy. Basically, they focus the satellite, well, the satellite telescope, rather like Hubble or James Webb, to a particular object in space, and they are measuring the wavelengths that they get back, right? And it reveals some sort of a spectrum. What does the spectrum look like? So like, here's an example of this K218b, right? They get a whole bunch of data back and dude is saying, hey, we've got signatures that are telling us there's water, there's carbon dioxide. Oh, and there's all of this stuff up here, dimethyl stuff and methane is all in, in this area right here. So this is what we really mean when they say they've discovered these things is they're getting wavelengths back. So essentially, some exoplanet farted, and the wavelength of the fart is something that we were able to record. But guys, I mean, I really want us to like back this train up even further because everybody's getting all excited that we've discovered stuff. And we're talking about looking at some data analysis. When we get to space exploration, nobody's discovering anything. Right, We have probes in our own solar system that go and look at stuff. And I would call that better research. The probe on Mars, for example, that's a real rover taking real samples of soil, taking real pictures of the, of the sky and the ground and all that kind of crazy stuff. That stuff's happening, right? But all of this data stuff, like that's not exploration. We're not discovering anything. Like we're, we're getting readings back. <laughs> and I almost kind of look at this as, as like, so you're telling me that if you're s measuring something from say, Los Angeles, California, you're gonna be able to detect that a mosquito fart that's wavelengths being projected from a street lamp in Paris 
like and i'm being real kind to the to the distances there but you see what i mean like we expect like some wavelength that's being promoted because of the star's ability to send the light back to us and whatever's in that wavelength back to us becomes this data set and look we're using pretty advanced stuff i'm not necessarily trying to armchair quarterback guys but i'm just saying that like we really think that this data can be super trustworthy and reliable to make these kind of conclusions. I mean, let's listen to the guy some more. The very possibility of it being there is enormous. So this is this is dimethyl sulfide. Yeah, that's that's the important gas. And why is that gas yeah. so important? It's important because uh, on Earth, it is produced only from life, uh, only um, mainly from microorganisms in the Earth's oceans. And it has been uh, known to be a robust biomarker if detected in planetary environments. And it had been predicted uh, to be so. And we had been looking for it. And, and that's why it's super important. How much of it is there? Can you tell? So we are not 100% sure yet. It could be anywhere of the order of a part per million. Um, so is that a lot? But, but it, it's a lot for that particular gas. On right. on Earth, it would be like significantly lower than that. Oh really? So on, we actually have lower amounts. Okay, so dudes are already saying that they essentially have a higher concentration of methane than they do on our planet, which is teeming with life. I mean, what are we saying here? Dude is saying that the data result shows that this exoplanet has way more methane gas than our planet does. And this is kind of what I mean. Like, can we trust the data? Are you seriously telling me that you found a planet that's got way more methane than planet Earth? That would be suggesting that this planet, like, has... 10 times more life on it than, than Earth does, if we're really making these kinds of conclusions. And not only that, but the presuppositions involved here. We're presupposing that only life can create this particular kind of gas. Well, nobody's been around before life existed on Earth, so we can't be 100% positive that's a true statement, right? So there's already presuppositions happening all over the place here, right? <laughs> And let's just go forward with hearing another little important segment from this guy. Talk us through that. No, it's it's a profound activity, this uh, search for biomarkers elsewhere, because the ramifications to society are enormous. So even if we detect the... Interesting. Why, why are the ramifications to society enormous? Because we found life someplace else? I mean, who cares? What does that even mean? It's not like we can travel there the molecule, uh, we have to be really, really sure that it's there and we have to be really sure it's from life uh, on another planet. There are many false positives that can happen. Uh, but the prospect of that being there has enormous ramifications because the search for life elsewhere has been one of the uh, longest standing uh, quest of, of our species, of humankind. Uh, so if yeah, so he's not wrong about that, right? But look, this is where I get a little bit upset because we're now talking about life on other planets. And look, <laughs> so what? I mean, even if this is a true statement that there's life on this planet, okay, and how is that really going to help human society in any way, shape, or form? And oh, by the way, like I just have a real big problem with the fact that non-believers and atheists just seem to think that this is some sort of significant issue for religious people. I don't see it that way. I actually did an episode once defending the claim that alien life helps support the God hypothesis, actually. But without us being able to go there, travel there, like what good does this information do? Like we got big problems on this planet. We've got starving people in every country and yet we're spending billions of dollars of research to look at outer space. 
I mean, the James Webb investment was significant. We're looking at all kinds of other ways to continue to invest in space exploration. There's some concept taking place to go visit our neighbors to the north, Alpha Centauri, which is our closest neighbor at 4.5 light years away. And let, let's break this down a little bit. Let's get into distances because distances in space have been simplified down to where we think, oh, it's no big deal. It's not that far away. Alpha Centauri is only four light years away. But how far away really is Alpha Centauri? Well, one light year is like six trillion miles. And trillion is a billion billion. Like the number is so astronomically big, we can't really comprehend it, right? We really can't comprehend these numbers. Light years not a, a measure of time, it's more a measure of distance. It's how far light travels in a year. And light's the fastest thing in the universe. Okay, well, how far away is that? Well, right now it would take if we went the speed of the space shuttle, which is kind of old technology, it would take 37,000 human years to go one light year. <laughs> 37,000 human years to just travel one light year. So to go four light years, that would be... 160,000 human years to go four light years. So it's, it takes about that long going space shuttle speeds to get to Alpha Centauri, our closest neighbor. And this exoplanet is like 124 light years away. <laughs> so the speed of the space shuttle takes 37,000 human years to go one light year. And to travel 124 light years away, that's just an astronomical amount of time. But hey, our technology's gotten better. With our current technology, we can actually send something fast enough in space that it'll only take 6,000 human years to go one light year. So even that, right? 6,000 human years to go 100 light years, let's do 100 times 6,000. So 600,000 human years to get to this planet that supposedly has water on it. <laughs> Are you kidding me, bro? Like, this is what I mean. Why is there ramifications for us? We can't get there. We have no evidence there's any intelligent life anywhere in the universe and definitely no sign that this exists on this planet. So why should we care? Why should this be a big deal? Like the skeptics have no problem like knocking people's faith in religiosity, but there's an insane amount of faith in space exploration. And again, air quotes time, exploration. We're not exploring anything. We're just looking at data. We're supposed to take this stuff seriously. Like, why should we? Honestly, like, this type of curiosity only makes sense to me when we look at it from a godly worldview. Humans wanting to understand our origins, wanting to be like God, create civilizations, create our own technology, space exploration, all of these things matter when we are greater than ourselves. When we're greater beings and we realize there's more out there than just us. But if we're just molecules in motion, if we're just scrambled up proteins, if we're just a, a result of hundreds of millions of years of copying errors from amino acids and proteins, why would amino acids and proteins give a hoot about another planet, about its origin? Like you can't explain that scientifically. But they appropriate the faith-based worldview all the time and don't even like get the memo. Like it's so ironic to me. <laughs> and let's get back to the whole evidence of exoplanet. So one of the ways that 
we measure the distance of a star is looking at parallax. Because believe it or not, a lot of the stars you see in the sky, like they're essentially look two dimensional to us, right? How can we really tell how far away a star is? Well, we use geometry basically to figure this out to some degree. We find what we consider a quote nearby star and we measure its distance with angles. But in this example, you see how there's background stars. We try to kind of do the same thing, making guesses with that. And then they use wavelengths of the color of the star to try to guess its luminosity and all these other type of educated guesses to gauge the distance of a star. So even in a lot of cases, we're playing guessing games with astronomy, right? And so when we say we've also discovered exoplanets, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> let's get back to the whole wavelength thing again that I, I mentioned earlier, right? We've got all these crazy looking wavelengths and they eventually give us photos. And when we say photos, guys, nobody's talking about like the ultra HD res that you have on your phone or these rad Nikon cameras that can like zoom in and give you these amazing images of the moon. No, no, no. We're talking about ultraviolet wavelengths giving us results, right? So this is really what Beta Pictoris, which is one of our one of our nearest exoplanets we found, this is what it looks like. They have to block out the sun and that little dot right there, that's Beta Pictoris B. And here's another example of data coming back from James Webb Telescope showing an exoplanet. You can see right there that B image is from this other planet, 51 Aridi and Eridani B. That little dot is the exoplanet. So these are the pictures of exoplanets. And I get real upset because the sources of truth, people like NASA promote misinformation, guys. Let me show you what I mean. So here is NASA's Beta Pictoris B. And when you're on the website, if you start seeing their exoplanet data, you can look at all these cool things, right? Again, this is like the Starwalk app on your phone, which shows all these hypothetical visualizations. Notice it showed that on the screen for a split second, but nobody's paying attention to that. All the, of the official science literature is gonna show you these fake images. Like you've got NASA showing us fake images. If you see videos that come from, you know, educational sites, scientific sites, they're gonna show you all this CG crap too. When the real image, it may as well be a freaking Rorschach pattern, right? And then they clean it up a little bit better and they show it to you like this. Okay, we're still just looking at a dot with the star blotted out. So this is what we really see. This kind of image is what we really see. Put this image of Gemini in a newspaper or on a magazine or on someone's TikTok and see if anybody's really going to give a crap about this. They're not. <laughs> Who cares? Nobody should care. But because of all the misinformation and all of the, the, the fake propaganda, because it is propaganda that gets done by these official sites, Next thing you know, it leads to stupid stuff like this reel right here. I'm sure you've heard the news of NASA discovering city lights on a planet seven trillion miles. Uh, no, actually, I haven't heard anything about that. Seven trillion miles away, huh? And they <laughs> I mean, had lights on the planet. Are you kidding me, bro? Are you kidding me right now, bro? Like, just stop it. Stop it right now. Nobody's found anything. I'm not going to be convinced just because James Webb data shows a freaking fart from a zillion, trillion, gajillion, billion miles away. The day that we land a probe somewhere and we're seeing real photos with real evidence and real data collection, then get back to me. But ain't nobody traveling no 60 light years away or 100 light years away or 200 light years away anytime soon. 
So did the guy discover information? Sure. James Webb brought back some data, yo. But should we like go have a ticker tape parade? Nope. But guess what's going to happen? As soon as this data is verified, then you're going to see it splashed in every freaking magazine everywhere. We found life somewhere else in the universe. No, we didn't, bro. Stop it. All right, gang, that's it for this episode. If you like my content, please consider subscribing to my channel. God bless you guys.